Milrat. We are back. Welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm Rob Kalvaroski, and as always, the yang to my yin is here. Susan Hobson's here doing her Friday dance, as always. Yeah, Monday. It's Monday in podcast world. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, no, no, we, how are you? We have, we, have to, we have to let this one slip because it's Friday the 13th, right? <laughs> and I came in in a little bit of a silly mood as a result. It's totally activated my childlike spirit, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently. And, for, and for Brooklyn, who's listening, your mom yep. used yep. to delete, 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 edit, edit. <laughs> <laughs> that was supposed to stay off the air, remember? <laughs> Fortunately, Rob, my, my you child. You that voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll make sure she is not listening in the background on this one. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah. Overall, your vibe, though, Susan, it's, it's contagious. You can feel it even over the years. <laughs> thanks, girlfriend. See, that's yeah. why I bring my authentic self to the mic, because you never know who needs some of that light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get Absolutely. you, for sure. And so we always have to start off with a quote. And I have one here from friend of the show, Dr. Richard Schwartz. Ooh, our and babe. he says, the more we can cultivate curiosity and compassion towards ourselves, mm. the more we can heal our wounds. Mm. Oh, yeah. And this is came up a lot recently. One is we're we're in the midst of doing our own IFS training, but also with some of the folks that I've been working with lately is they have a tendency either to have stuffed it down or stuffed it to the side. Or also they have this element sometimes where it's like you're almost fighting the part. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the IFS framework, what we want to do is actually give love and compassion to these parts. And when Dick talks about curiosity, it's about understanding what it's doing and why it's doing it for yes. you. Yes. And with those answers, you can unlock them. They'll actually naturally transfer roles sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the key. So that's beautiful. I love yeah. that. It's it's really talking about under the the waterline essentially is what what I would uh, resonate with in in when it not just self development but professional development as well because you really can't separate that professional from um, individual self. That's a great Amen. point, and that's our special guest from today. Mm -hmm. Angie McCabe is joining us. She's the CEO at Intuity in performance and the host of the human side of business podcast angie how whoop, are you? <laughs> <laughs> i had to break up the dance one more time oh, <laughs> for our girl Ange. how are you Ange? welcome to the show thank you so much thank you for the wonderful introduction rob i really appreciate you and susan your energy like i said it's just vibing you're, you're waking me up I don't I need coffee when we're, when we're around Susan, right? <laughs> Ooh, highest compliment you could ever pay me. <laughs> I mean it. I mean it. So, Ange, tell our audience all about yourself. We're so uh, excited to have you on the show, but let's plug our audience into some of your awesomeness and especially some of that backstory in terms of how you landed here today with us talking about performance and, and everything else leadership that we're going to get yeah, into. Yeah, definitely. Working a little bit backwards, I met Rob a few months back on the Human Side of Business podcast and was just delighted with his insights and all of the fantastic things he had to say about uh, individual and team performance. And there's just a lot of synergies there. And uh, towards the end of our call in the green room afterwards, you know, I'd said to Rob, I was like, I know you have a podcast too. What do you think? And so I kind of pitched and Rob was like, yeah, I'm on board. Let me talk to Susan. We'll get you in. Um, but what has brought me to where I am today, I guess, is a whole host of things. Everybody has their backstory, right? Um, so I'm an HR practitioner by trade, 15 plus years in the industry, um, in leadership roles. And I found myself within my office or the confounds of this organization asking myself, is this it? And knowing that there was this niggling thing as I moved up or laterally within organizations that I didn't really fit. And at first it was almost like a self-shaming thing. Like I feel crappy because I don't fit within this organization, or I feel crappy because the leadership styles aren't resonating or 
you know, what's, why am I so different? Why am I thinking differently about this type of stuff? Why can't I just go with the flow? Um, and so being the self-proclaimed HR geek that I am, I did a SWOT analysis and I started to open my own eyes to be like, you know what, my differentiating factors are amazing. And I have a lot to say, and I've learned a lot about leadership, what to do and what not to do. Um, some personal experience, some otherwise, because we all grow as humans. But what really fired me up was the opportunity as an HR practitioner, you get to dip your toes in that coaching sphere. Obviously, it's not true coaching, but you get a, a taste of it, we'll say. Right. And so that really fired me up along with the opportunity of not just the training and development side, but really graduating individuals from knowledge to action. I'm super passionate about that. And so I went down the trajectory of self-development, both personally as well as professionally. And so um, I reinvested myself. I'm an ICF certified ACC coach. Um, amongst that, I was awarded top 25 HR professionals in 2016 through HR Reporter, um, DISC and Emotional Intelligence Assessor, as well as Facilitator and Facilitating Qualifications as well. And so that had brought me into really starting to build my own confidence as a professional, because I don't know how to fully explain this, but in my world, I felt like my persona was tied to the organization. And now that I'm an entrepreneur, my persona is my persona. And so when people ask who is Ange pre-COVID and, and, and pre-intuitive performance, I would say things like, I'm an HR professional. I'm certified in this. I'm this, that, the other thing. And now when I'm asked, you know, tell me about yourself, I kind of cringe because the new Ange is like, well, I'm a single mom. And I'm really passionate about helping people elevate their performance and their leadership for success. It's not about attaching myself to a job title or a thing, right? It's more about now. So what type of impact can I have on people in, in, from a place of positivity and also, you know, being able to leave individuals in a better place than, than when we first found them, right? So how can I give? How can I show up? And it's it's amazing how when you come out from underneath, and, and I think Susan and Rob, you can um, um, kind of parody off what I'm saying here. It's amazing that when you come from underneath an organization that you really start to bloom because you know that your success factor is based on what you're willing to put in. You know that you're going to get two X out of in the sense of, you know, abundance when we're looking at it from that perspective. So that was the the crux of intuitive performance. We open our doors a week to the day um, of our first round of COVID. So that was wicked. Great <laughs> resilience was our theme for the first year. <laughs> no kidding. Um, we're super, super lucky in the sense of having community where we're at here in Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, also, you know, an outward community in the coaching industry where I found my business partner, Scott Rust. So he's our COO. Um, we've opened up locations in Quebec and Ontario. So we're doing fantastic. We've grown by 46% last year and we're exporting into the US. So it's like, hey, do not have to answer COVID. Um, what so, a success story. Yeah, things have been really going in the sense of um, upward trajectory because it's it's really, I really subscribe to the mindset pieces and ensuring that there's as much, I call it integration instead of work-life balance. <laughs> mm, we love that too. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. So that's a little bit about me. Um, my driver is my son. Uh, so funny story, just in short, it was really weird because when I went to open the doors legally for intuitive performance um, four years ago, my son, the week prior had said, mama, you should start your own company. And I was just like, you know what? That's a good job. And then being a proud mom, I went back to my son and I was like, hey, mama started her new company. But because at that point in time, he was five, now 10, um, he, I didn't, I didn't tell him what I was doing because it's like, how do you explain coaching and consulting and facilitating and emotional intelligence to a five-year-old, right? Like <laughs> basically it's, I help people, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So anyways, <laughs> there was actually a communication elevation there for us because a week later, I was proud and announced to him that I opened the business. He's like, no way. When do I get to go to the toy factory? And at that moment, <laughs> my heart just hurt for him. <laughs> I had to then let him down the first day of the business, right? Yeah, mama um, did not open a toy factory. <laughs> 
So, oh, but since then he's, he's yeah. identified how proud he is and he can see how hard I'm working. And it's not about how hard I'm working, but the passion that I have behind my work. Mm-hmm. And, and that is my fire is, is really watching him grow and develop as well as being able to experience entre- entrepreneurship at his age. Um, and of course, according to his level. Oh, so much to ask the edge. <laughs> I feel like I got to rewind the game tape all the way back to like sort of the beginning of your hero's journey when you were describing how difficult it was for you to really step into and own your sweet spot in the context of corporate. Why is that still a thing in 2023? Honestly, I think that's an amazing question with multiple layers like an onion. I think that there's old beliefs that are still in organizations, not old people. I want to be very. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make sure we we rewind and just uh, repeat that one for the (laughs) ones in the back row, right? (laughs) Old belief systems. Old beliefs, right? Old beliefs in the way that we do business and the way that we lead business. Um, I, I think that's the number one thing. And also seeing the value in what a lot of people call soft skills, I don't think are soft skills. Oof. It's freaking hard to be vulnerable. Right? Um, it's not fun always to be humble. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has an ego. Like, this is okay. This is not hard okay. work. It's hard work. Yeah. But it's consistently competing with operational needs and mm-hmm. the drivers of sales and or profits. Mm-hmm. So I I feel that the reason why people are still feeling stressed or not connected in the workplace or maybe not heard is because there's an opportunity for more emphasis to be put into how a leader is showing up and their habits. Mm. For example, I was working with our whole person leadership cohort for a company um, just last week. And we were talking about uh, a leadership self-assessment that we built based off of evidence-based information, et cetera, et cetera. And so we started talking about leadership habits. And when I started asking coach approach questions in that session around what makes up your leadership habit and what specific habits do you currently have in play versus what would you want to elevate? Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a lot of like deer in the headlights. And, and these are very intelligent people with MBAs and PhDs and, you know, accelerated degrees, et cetera. But they can't answer these questions because it's not common language mm-hmm. um, or, or commonality in the sense of culture and norms to ensure that we're exploring human-centric leadership approaches. I know Rob's got lots to say about that. (laughs) I see him teeing it up. So, and just to get there, right? Like, what are some of those habits that leaders should instill to make sure they're showing up for their people? Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic question. And I mean, of course, I could pull out the top 10, top 15. um, But for time's sakes (laughs) of the podcast, I think the things that really resonate with me Um, is understanding your leadership why and leadership styles are something that should be levers or something that you lean into and adapt to based on the environment, context, and your team member. So it's, it's really about the leadership tuning into their own leadership skills in the first instance, so internally, and then the external stuff. So things like digital literacy, Um, you know, uh, cultural awareness, sustainability and ESG, like all that stuff is big and it's predominant and it should be. But those are things that I feel are harder skills that can be just easily learned versus the things that need to be practiced, right? So ensuring that it's a psychological safe place to communicate. That can't just be a one and done. Like you can't just have a policy and check it off or you can't just have a workshop and be like, we're good to go because that's not the case, right? We're humans and we can smell BS. Um, at the end of the day, it's really about showing up. And, and it really spoke to me, Rob, in the quote earlier in this session around curiosity, right? Because as a leader, it should be more about learnership versus leadership. So as a leader, I have the responsibility and the opportunity to lead people on a daily basis. And each day I need to show up as a curious leader so that I can learn different things. It's not about, okay, I've done that thing. I have this, I have that. Um, It's really about tapping into our emotional intelligence skills and being able to wrap this all together in a nice package so that we can give to our team members. 
How do we leverage organizations to want to make space for this type of initiative? Because what you just said a second ago, right, is that this directly competes with those operational priorities. Mm -hmm. So how do you make that case for those leaders when you're trying to come in on site, right, and get some of this uh, development done with their leaders? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great question, too. My own personal beliefs are that someday in the nearest season, we'll be able to talk about the value of leadership without attaching it to a business case or financials or the bottom line. We'll just know that this is something that is desperately needed to ensure that there's engagement um, and proper succession planning, et cetera. In today's market, I definitely emphasize, or not emphasize, excuse me, um, I feel compassionate or compassion towards leaders because there's so many different things pulling on their attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we think about post-COVID things, some organizations are still working through a hybrid workplace. And what does that look like? You know, we're still dealing with logistical issues. Um, And, you know, what about inflation and all this economic stuff that comes into play? So I I can empathize with that world. However, I'd add that if an organization is playing a longer game, meaning that there's leadership development investment, what that does for us is that it increases productivity, which impacts the bottom line. It increases engagement and, and people staying with the organization, not just you know, ticking the clock type thing, right. um, which also which positively, hard. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which also positively impacts the the bottom line. And then there's mm-hmm. also the engagement around fostering growth within the organization, you know, and that's twofold to increase the bottom line, but also, or excuse me, increase revenues, but also come in at a place where they have more strategic advantages. Because I think in some circumstances, there's an opportunity to pour, put more limelight that the more that I invest in my team members, the more the stronger that we're going to have a bond with them, meaning they're going to stay in the organization. It's not going to cost me two times an employee's salary to replace them, which is plus plus with inf- inflation, but rather they're going to start to be innovative because they feel safe in my organization and they feel heard and valued as well as invested in. Love it. And all the neuroscience proves that that's where they're going to actualize on their potential as well, right? Yes, absolutely. Let's absolutely. Play that tape forward in terms of the compound value of that. Sorry, Rob, I saw you step up there. No, it's that's the interesting part, right? Is, mm-hmm. is actually like, I mean, we've talked about it a lot on this show, right? Like the stats and the ROI is all there. All there. Mm-hmm. And it's really, it's that divide we talked with Pat about a few weeks ago is there's a divide between what we know and the fear that's kicking around, Mm -hmm. right? And the true, I guess the true answer or the true question is how do we get folks to step back and calm and then choose from a rational or logical point of view Mm. to actually make that investment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My short dollar question. Right? <laughs> How do we get them into a parasympathetic state, right? So that yeah. they can actually make a high quality decision where their long game is concerned, where their people's well-being is concerned. Absolutely. Short answer, building upon emotional intelligence skill sets. Mm-hmm. Neurological answer, ask them to take six seconds, Right. We know that it takes us logistically or strategically six seconds to move through an emotion. So we have an an old knee jerk reaction to why do I have to have a training and development budget? It's crap. You know, we're not getting return on investment. We're getting all these accolades. Great, but it does nothing for my business. Take six seconds and really think about it from the perspective of what could this look like if you actually get super strategic with the training and development that you're offering your team members or from a leadership perspective? Mm, Um, Yeah. That's, That's what I would offer. I love that pivot because it gets them into the possibility thinking, you know, and I feel like that's what's really, that's what these leaders are up against when they're making decisions out of a space of scarcity in their nervous system. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because a lot of times what we're hearing, especially in the past uh, 24 months is, you know, budget and mm-hmm. time, 
Mm-hmm. And there doesn't have to be a huge investment in budget, budget, right? We don't have to pay for courses. There could be internal mentorship as a stepping stone right. or, or, you know, internal uh, investment for coaches. Obviously, there's value in external providers as well, but it you don't have to do everything all at once. And it almost feels like we have a zero to 100 mm. mentality when it comes to those types of things, right? So it's it's baby steps in how can we continue to scale and grow. Yeah, baby steps are always best in the growth <laughs> game. Let's talk about the leaders out there who are ready to make that investment because they're mm. listening to the show, we're making that case. Right. And they're really seeing the opportunity that lies in that choice. Mm-hmm. How do they check that and validate which direction to go with their leadership development and training? I, I think I think this is a multifaceted question. So internally, it's sitting back and reflecting upon, you know, what's my strengths, my weaknesses, opportunities, and threats as a leader. Um, I often like to flip it as to more of an opportunities versus weaknesses um, and then asking upwards, right? Mm-hmm. Asking up, asking down, mm-hmm. you know, I'm looking at my performance based on XYZ or my leadership skills based on XYZ. What do you think? I really want your honest and candid feedback. And then there's also evidence-backed assessments that individuals can take from a leadership perspective, depending on what realm they want to go into, which can collectively give them strategic positioning around what things to poke at or be curious about next. I love that. Mm. I love that. (laughs) I want to get into some of the high performance background that you carry. And I want to just get into some of the little tiny bit of the backstory in terms of why you're so passionate about high performance, so much so that you would come from HR and start your own business around the very subject. (laughs) Um, uh, I what makes like, you so passionate about high performance, girl? I, I feel like there's two, it's it's two pronged story for me. So from a business perspective, I seen a problem that needed to be solved, and it's a global problem, right? We know that in leadership, there's skills gaps that are costing organizations over two billion dollars a year. That's huge. But when you start to ask about again, going back to previously in the podcast today and your previous podcast too. When you're talking about leadership, it's still a bit nuanced, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, if it's costing us that much money, why is it nuanced? So so that's a part of the business passion for me. Um, And I have a a natural gift to gap. (laughs) So it it really gives me a platform so that I can service people. And I know that I've I've come in my own or I've found my own niche, right? The second piece to it is very personal. So my son was diagnosed with um, ADHD, dyslexia, and phonological dysmorphia, meaning that sounding of words doesn't sound the same to him. So imagine having that trifecta at the age of five in grade primary. He would come home from school and he would just be like, mom, I don't want to be here. And I still get goosebumps telling this story because it just poked holes in my heart. And at first I took it personal to say, what type of parent am I? What am I doing wrong? What do I need to be doing? But then I took that six second break and I started asking myself, what can I do to understand him more and what he needs? Because obviously the school wasn't providing it at that point in time for various reasons. Um, We started doing our own investigations and we went from emotional distraught and not being able to express himself to now at 10 years old, he can look at me and he can say, mama, I don't feel heard right now. Like he said those words to me just last week. I don't feel heard right now. And I'm so proud of him. And so imagine that within four years now, again, he's a 10 year old boy, right? So (laughs) keep, keep the green, keep this with a grain of salt. But in four years, we can go from fire tempers to being able to kind of cool our jets and regulate our own emotions and then express our emotions. He's speaking emotionally at a higher level than most male adults. Wow. And what came up for me was one, good. We found part of his resolution amongst psychology and medication and doing our stuff with him. And two, holy crow, can we imagine what we could do with adults if we were open and susceptible to these types of things? So when it comes to the performance piece side of it, 
<clears throat> I feel strongly about co-creating goals with our clients to ensure that you know, we're meeting them where we need to be from a practicality perspective and making sure that they get return on investment and ensuring that we're looking below that proverbial water line. Because anybody can learn how to speak. Anybody can learn how to do those hard skills of, you know, organization or understanding technology and stuff like that. But when it comes to things like understanding your impact around your own confidence to how you lead, that's a deeper level, which also there's there's obviously passion when it comes to emotional intelligence that backs into that. I love that. And then I guess, so we have to sh- share with everyone, right? So you're you're a fellow Canadian. And, I am. Yeah. And, and you're the vice president of player development at the Martello Buccaneers, which is a hockey club out in Nova Scotia. That's and correct. So, what, what I want to know is, one is like, what are you teaching? Because it's not adults, right? It's, it's no. kids. And so what, do, what kind of mental performance and leadership skills are you teaching to your young athletes? Mm. Coincidentally, that's a good running question, Rob. So based on my personal passion to emotional intelligence, I want to be able to assist coaches not just in hockey, but this is where we're starting, but across all sports to be able to help train and mentor their athletes around the 50% of, of the, the sport itself mindset that they're not normally getting, right? Mm-hmm. So we're the only team in Nova Scotia, to my knowledge at this point in time, um, at this level where we do evidence-backed emotional intelligence assessments with our team. We do DISC assessments with our team. Um, And what that means is we're understanding their behaviors and their baselines as to how they're showing up from a mindset in the hockey world. And then from there, we have our hard stats based on, you know, um, fast to play to puck, shots on goal, shots saved, et cetera, et cetera. And it's super cool because when you can combine that data, you can really leverage that information to coaches in the world so that they can step up and coach their players the way that they need to be coached versus that corralled approach to coaching where some organically pick it up and others are struggling and may walk away from the sport because they're not being spoken to the way that they need to. So it's two-pronged in the sense of helping build up confidence and communication and leadership styles and influence within our team players as well as continuing to support our coaching staff so that they can show up in the best way that they can for the, for the players. I got to go here. Somebody who played the sport for over two decades and it took me all the way to the very end of my career to even be exposed to mindset. How come this is still such a gap in the world of professional athletics? Why? Because I'm assuming that the team that you're describing that you're working with is a semi-pro team, right? So it's the same idea, right? Uh, they're, they're they're actually a triple A team. Not AAA. even AAA. Yeah. Okay, okay. So how old are they? They're 16. 16. So even still, like, you know, for me, I always say like, we need to start at the grassroots, right? In terms of the athlete setting that the right right foundation so that they can even handle the pressures of high performance athletics, right? Um, We've had several different uh, experts on our show, including Corey Chevry from Nova Scotia. I'm not sure if you know her. She's um, the coach of the women's national hockey team, but uh, But yeah, this is something we talk about, right? It's like it often takes until we're 16, 17, or 18 to even be exposed to the very concept of mindset when legitimately performance in an athletic space is 90% mental. So why is that still such a gap in this athletic world of ours? Oftentimes what I'm seeing is that if I'm being totally vulnerable and candid, our coaches are paid. But oftentimes they they come in as player coaches, right? Mm-hmm. So so it's not a formalized training program aside exactly from it. what the association's expecting of them, mm-hmm. which leaves a huge gap in things like habits and behaviors and mindsets mm-hmm. for players. Um, I feel that there is a huge opportunity and landscape for athletic coaches to be able to dial in so that they can again meet their players where they're at, right? So to your point, younger groups, what does it mean to even understand what's the difference between pressure and stress? Mm -hmm. 
is pressure good? Is stress good? Which, which mm-hmm. one do we look at? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, all the way up to our 16 year olds where it's like, okay, help me understand what's going on right now, where do you want to be? And let's problem solve in between. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I love it. It's just so fascinating, right? Cause we see the same gap in the corporate world where the yeah. leaders don't even get leadership training till f- on average 42 years old, right? 10 years <laughs> in the leadership position, but it's the same thing in the athletic world. These coaches are not getting leadership development. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I definitely subscribe to that a hundred percent. So Angie, I got to ask a question. So you are, obviously you are the host of the human side of business podcast. Yeah. And you've done at this point, I looked yesterday, you have 118 episodes out. And we do. I'd love to ask you, like, what are some of the top things that you've learned while hosting the show? Mm-hmm. That's a toughie. Um, we've had so many quality guests, especially in the past year. But instead of individual quotes that stand out, I feel like it's more so trends in the sense that as a leader, it's a responsibility, not a title or a position. That is a theme that has been coming out, as well as that you need to understand when you move into leadership, whether you're an experienced leader or not, you're now accountable for a team, not just yourself. Just like when you're promoted from you know, a forward to captain of a hockey team, I use this parody a lot. You're you're now looking at the global masses, not just individually. Um, it also means tapping back into that continuous learning piece, whether it be from just learning how to deploy curiosity with yourself as a leader to mentorship, to coaching, to professional development, whatever that looks like, you're constantly challenging yourself as a leader to continue to reach to those blind spots and being able to elevate because you can only lead as far as you've come. Um, the other thing is that being a leader, one of the other trends I've heard over and over and over again is the ability to communicate and stay flexible. And so when we're kind of backing that into curiosity, communication is huge, right? So seeing some leaders that do it really well, they've adapted to hybrid workplaces. Um, They make sure that it's not just operational communication. They're asking people how they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Versus, you know, we still have some leaders out there that, that we've heard from where it's like, well, I've told them like once or twice, why aren't they doing it? So again, backs into communication modes, methods, and how we're approaching it. So those would be the top things that come to mind. There's been some amazing quotes um, with regards to the human business podcast. And there isn't one that I can actually bring out, but um, there's some phenomenal information there for sure. And how about, let's distill this down to the number one skill set that you want to really put emphasis around for our leaders listening today in terms of if they could just choose one, right, to double down on today that would prepare them for 2024 and beyond, right? Mm. The future of work. Where what would you say that skill set is? That's a tough one. Um, and I'm trying not to allow my personal bias to come into play. <laughs> personal bias being emotional intelligence. Yeah. Um, I think for me, the number one skill set that leaders ought to have is continuous learning because that opens the doors for everything else. Um, You know, we're not the end all be all uh, in practitioners. There's, again, uh, that vein of continuous learning and what that means to each leader differentiates based on organizations that they're in. I love that. And yeah, you're right. And well, I mean, your personal bias is not is not is definitely not wrong. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, like emotional intelligence is, I think, one of the top two skills, including self awareness. Yes, that business leadership leaders can today. have. Mm-hmm. So, it's it's definitely super important. But yeah, having the growth mindset includes all of that. So that's mm-hmm. always a good start. Mm-hmm. Now, we got to ask you our big question before oh, we get you out of here. Yeah. What do you want your legacy to be? That's such a huge, I feel like that's a philosophical question. Uh, By design, (laughs) Ange, by design. (laughs) 
Um, essentially, when I think about what I want to leave as a legacy from my leadership or from my desk is it sounds kind of hokey, but I mean this genuinely from the deepest depths of myself that I want to leave the leadership or corporate place, um, corporate organizations, I should say, in a better place than, than how I found them or how I first been uh, acquainted with them in the sense that companies can then clearly identify leadership development paths in ways that are intentional and meaningful, like they get it. It's not just kind of like, eh, we've got 10 grand in the budget. What can we do? It's like, okay, I know with this role and with this person, we need to focus on X, Y, Z to make sure that they can get into executive leadership within the next two years. Um, and, And I think that the value is really important to be seen and more predominantly heard in the sense of leadership skill sets. Um, it rings through with this podcast today and invalidates it that we really need to normalize the soft skills of leadership or emotional intelligence or growth mindset or whatever you subscribe to, but making that not just a buzzword or a trend or an article that we read in HBR, but rather known stuff that's within culture. Amazing. And so for folks, if you want to find Ange, I've dropped her LinkedIn in the podcast notes, Ange McCabe. You can also check out intuityperformance.com. And then wherever you're listening to the Leadership Launchpad Project, if you just search for the Human Side of Business podcast, you'll find it wherever you're listening. So hit subscribe to that one as well. Ange, is there anywhere else you want folks to find you? Um. LinkedIn, website, podcast, uh, we can be reached out directly at info at intuityperformance.com if there's any inquiries or um, connections that need to be made. Absolutely. So I'll drop that in the podcast notes as well. Thank you. Obviously, for us, for your high-performance leadership mindset needs, one-on-one coaching, group programs, and more, head on over to EliteHighPerformance.com and also hit subscribe to the show and share it with any leaders in your life. Susan, is there anything you want to leave folks with today? I feel like we got to hit the rewind and rewatch this game tape. It's just so ripe with so many valuable insights and actionable advice. I love this learnership versus leadership concept. I'm still like ruminating on this one. So I know that's definitely going to find its way into my vernacular. Thank you, Edge, for bringing the heat and also for just really inspiring our audience to get on this journey of continuous improvement. We happen to agree, don't we, Rob, that that is the number one really most important priority for all our leaders to really own. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And for me, I think the one word that and used early on the show when she was talking about work-life balance, she said integration. Mm. And this is the key piece for me about when you learn emotional intelligence or you learn self-awareness or you learn growth, like all these things, right? It's, it's not about learning the skill on a textbook or on a slideshow. Mm-hmm. It's about integrating it into yourself and into your daily practice. And so this is what we heard also from Angie's son, right? Is I feel unheard right now. That's integration. Mm. That's not just the PowerPoint. That's living it as you. And yeah. so for folks out there, you can learn emotional intelligence in like an hour <laughs> But it, it actually requires a lot of practice and integration to become a skill that you can use. So get out there, learn the skills, integrate the skills, keep on your leadership journey. And thank you so much for joining us this week. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.